do. So anyway, so let's uh, let's get to where we left the class last time. And uh, let me see, class four. We did the glossary. We we're talking about the family, the satisfaction, sacrifice. Remember sacrifice. Um, so now the next, and, and these are themes, right? We're, we're talking about themes. We're talking about the messages that, uh, that the author wants to give us with his story, right? And uh, of all the messages, identity, remember we talked about identity, about sacrifice, sacrificing ourselves for our friends and family, the satisfaction, the home, we talked about the home, families, language, stereotype, perseverance, all that stuff, remember? Remember I said, if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Right? So remember that. So now we're going to talk about society and class. Society and class. In many novels, issues of class and society have to do with money, wealth, and poverty for people. In Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Name, however, money and wealth aren't so much the issue as our questions of belonging and not belonging. In other words, do rats belong here? Do they not belong here? Where do the rats belong? In Nim, experiments have changed the rats so deeply that they are unable to fit in with their own kind any longer. But it is also unclear to them whom they can fit in with. They don't know. They don't know where, where do they fit. They are outcasts from rat society. They're no longer part of rat society. Since they can't just give up, the rats are forced to figure out how to build an entirely new society and to make up the rules that will govern it. The name experiments give the rats an amazing chance to completely reinvent society or at least their society, right? These rats don't have a chance without clearly defined class and social rules, they will collapse into total rat chaos, right? No rules, no laws. So they have to do this. <laughs> they have to create some sort of society. And that's what we see, right? They wanna move out. They wanna go somewhere else. Now, the next issue, the next theme, transformation. Characters in Miss Frisbee and the Rats of Nim are transformed by their interactions with other characters, by their experience. And of course, they are transformed by science. The thread that connects them that connects all these different types of transformation is knowledge, knowledge. When the rats escape from them, they don't simply flex their own muscles and scurry back to life as they knew it. Instead, they use their knowledge to transform their lives and their society. Mrs. Frisbee's life 
is transformed by knowledge as well. Knowing the backstory of her husband opens up all sorts of possibilities for her and her children. The rats cannot really take credit for the changes to their lives. It was all Nim doing, right? The experiments. Nim gave the rats the tools to change, but it was their own ingenuity and perseverance that really allowed them to change their lives and create the plan. Okay, so now when we are analyzing a book, right? And this is something that happens all the time, right? If you come to any of my classes, any of my literature classes, that's what we're doing. We're analyzing. And that's what this is all about, what we're doing throughout this class. We're analyzing the author, who the author was, what he liked, what he didn't like, his family. We're analyzing the plot. What happened during the plot? Why did things happen the way they did? What kind of message does the author want us to get? What are the messages? What are the themes? And we analyze all kinds of stuff. We can analyze like we've been doing, we've been talking about it, <clears throat> as to who the protagonist is, who the antagonist is, what kind of a plot are we dealing with? One that goes up and then down, or one that goes down and then up. I mean, what's going on here? We also analyze even the words. We read the glossary. We read the words that maybe we didn't know they existed but that the author uses. Now we haven't really gone into metaphors and things like that because he really didn't use too many metaphors. But there is one analysis that we have to do. And that is the tone, the tone right here, the tone. And the tone of a novel is whether the author intended the novel to be a comedy, to be funny, comedic, right? A comedic novel, a funny novel, right? Whether the author intended the novel to be sad. Is it a sad novel? Is it a novel that makes you cry? What type of a novel is it, right? Does it make you cry? So the people that know this book really well they say the tone is serious. This is a serious novel. And why is it a serious novel? Why? Why is it a serious novel? I mean, they made a cartoon out of it, right? And cartoons are usually fun. But it's a serious novel, but why? Because could it be that it deals with so many? serious subjects like transformation, like family, like bias, stereotyping, you know, when you stereotype someone. Now, they say these literature 
people, right? These people that analyze books. They say it's also somber. Somber. What does the word somber mean? Does anybody know? I'm going to read to you what the word somber means. Somber definition. It says dark or dull in tone, gloomy, gloomy. A gloomy mood, a mood that is not happy, not happy, right? So is there a little bit of sadness, a little bit of gloominess in the novel? They also say it's sensitive. Why do they say that it's sensitive? Now let's take a look. I'm when I'm looking in my in my phone over here. So let's see what it says about sensitive. Sensitive definition. It says, quick to detect or respond to a person or a person's behavior having or displaying a quick and delicate appreciation for others. Or also quick to detect or respond to slight changes, signals or influences. In other words, are we sensitive to cold weather? Are we sensitive to hot weather? When it gets hot, it bothers us. When it gets cold, it bothers us. But also when we look at other people that have got something wrong with them and we say, oh, I feel bad for that person. That's also being sensitive. Are the rats being sensitive? Do they show sensitivity? And then finally, it says sparse. What does the word sparse mean? I'm a little confused here. What does the word sparse mean? It says here, thinly dispersed or scattered. Meager, a little bit, a little bit of something. Do you agree with that? I don't know. What do you think? So I guess it means maybe not deep enough, not philosophical enough, but I think it is, right? I think it's somber, it's sensitive, it's serious. Sparse, I don't know. I leave it up to you. You decide whether you think the novel is sparse. Now, just the facts, ma'am. O'Brien, O'Brien's direct all business tone has a lot to do with keeping the reader glued to the story. That's what he wants to do. He writes in a way that he doesn't put a lot of fancy words in there. Maybe that, that's what, what that means about being sparse, right? That he doesn't really put a lot of fancy words. This is in one of those stories where you're doing a lot of guessing or trying to read the author's mind. He tells you right from the beginning what it is that he's trying to accomplish. And the narrators are not trying to get you so emotionally wrapped up in these characters that you can hardly tend to turn the page for fear of crying. Instead, the book is all about making the story move along quickly. So it's a fast moving story. Does it work? What do you think? We sure think it does. Take as an example, the moment when Mrs. Frisbee 
is trapped in the birdcage, desperate to get out and warn the other rats. The day after next, the truck would come with its poison gas, and that would be the end of all their plans. Unless they could be warned, wearily, she got up to climb the wall and try again. This is a quote from the book. We don't have to do a lot of emotional language here. Wearily is about as touchy-feely as it gets, right? When you're wearily about something, you're worrying about something. Instead, it's just the facts. A lady in a birdcage with a need to get out. So brief, and yet it tells us everything we need to know. Plus, because the story fits together so well, we already know that Mrs. Frisbee wants out of the cage. We know she has information that the rats need. And we know that she feels a responsibility to help others. There's no need to get all melodramatic on us when we already know what's at stake. So it's a straightforward kind of a narrative of a story. He doesn't, the author doesn't go into a lot of going around and around and around over explaining. He goes right to it. He tells you exactly what's going on. That's not to say though, that the tone doesn't have a flair for the dramatic occasionally. The weight of the world seemed to fall on Mrs. Frisbee's tiny shoulders, quote unquote, right? As she realized that she was trapped, trapped, captive, a prisoner. Now, how would she tell those brave, smart, selfless rats that their death could be driving this way any minute. It was all too much for Mrs. Frisbee, who saw her children's small, sweet faces flash before her eyes, before she sank down, down, down to the bottom of the birdcage in a deep faint. These moments of melodrama help us remember that while we're reading a story about a bunch of rodents, those rodents have very real dreams, hopes, fears, and feelings, just like us. If it were all facts, all the time, this story probably wouldn't fit home as powerfully wouldn't hit home as powerfully as it does. Okay, so here's another bit of analysis. Genre, setting, and other stuff, right? Other stuff. Genre, what does the word genre mean? Does anybody know what the word genre is? Anybody out there? Is it type? Type, in other words, how many types of novels are there? Detective, science fiction, horror, drama, love. These are types of novels. And this fits a certain genre, a certain type of a novel. Now setting, where is a set? Where is this happening? And that's what the word setting means. And we're going to find out. We are going to find out. So the genre is young adult literature. Young adult literature used to get a bad rap. People didn't like it at one time. But you know who gave it a bad rap? Adults, 
Adults said, oh, I don't want young adult literature. But you know what? The young adult people, they love it. They want it. Who is to tell them they can't read it? Adults who like old adult literature, a look around and any of the authors today who are raking in the big dollars, the big money, like Stephanie Meyer and J.K. Rowling or Suzanne Collins should tell you that young adult literature is back and forth. Back and forth is getting very popular, very popular. Harry Potter. Harry Potter is young adult. Harry Potter is young adult. Young adult literature. Oh, I see somebody is making a comment. J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I would say that J.R., you're totally correct. J.R. Tolkien wrote, wrote, um, you know, young adult, Lord of the Rings, right? The Hobbit, he wrote The Hobbit, he wrote Lord of the Rings. Now, what an incredible piece of work. Hey, Alan, did you, did you read Lord of the Rings? Were you in my class for Lord of the Rings? Because, you know, I covered Lord of the Rings and I covered, um, the Hobbit? Well, not yet. Well, the class is over. You should have. You should have come to my class. You should have come to my class. Maybe one day we'll do it again, but but you should have. When we advertise these kind of big name books, you should come. You know, like right now we're covering uh, uh, Gone with the Wind. Um, Ah, Death on the Nile and Le Miserable. Oh, yeah. Wow, what a great uh, book Death on the Nile was, huh? That was really cool. Kind of a twist at the end, right? Kind of a twist at the end. Because the couple tried to get away with murder. And they thought they were being smart. But Detective Buffalo would not have it. And he caught them. Yeah, he caught them. And uh, Le Miserable, yeah, that's a big one, too. That was a big one. Um, Gone with the Wind is another one. Yeah, you should, you should come to those classes. Believe me, you're going to learn a lot. Um, so anyway, so yeah, J.R. Tolkien, totally agree with you. Now, young adult literature often focuses on, you guessed it, young adults, which the American Library Association defines, defines as people between 12 and 18. It also often features younger as smaller, uh, younger or smaller characters that need to solve a big problem or face off against something or someone more powerful in spite of their young age. While the characters in Rats aren't teens or even humans, this book is definitely for young adults and fits the bill for young adult literature because the relatively powerless animal characters square off against some pretty big forces. Ah and they win, of course. They actually win. So what's up with the title? Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. What the heck is that all about? Wouldn't Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim make an excellent title for a rock band? Ha <laughs> ha, what do you think about that? Imagine that. Imagine if the Beatles would have been called Paul Harrison and the Rats of Nim or Ringo Starr and the Rats of Nim. That would have been something, right? Mrs. Frisbee 
as the lead, or, you know, if you say Mrs. Frisbee and the rats of name, she would have been like the lead singer and the rats backing her up on vocals and guitars. Ooh. Maybe Brutus would have been playing something, right? The bass. Karaoke, yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe we could go to a karaoke band, a karaoke bar and, uh, and sing along with Mrs. Frisbee and the rats of men. Can't you just see the band's t-shirts and hear the roar of the crowd? Hey, Mrs. Frisbee! No? Okay, maybe it wouldn't make such a great name for a band, but it sure works for the book. We have Mrs. Frisbee front and center, and then the rats come in and do a lot of supporting work. Who do you think deserves top billing in this ensemble? Mrs. Frisbee or the rats? Yeah, who, who should get the, you know, who is the big, the big character here? Is it Mrs. Frisbee or the rats? When the movie version of Rats came out, the title was changed to The Secret of Nim because the filmmakers believed that people wouldn't want to see a movie about rats. However, the movie was still about rats. So we're not quite sure how that logic kind of worked, right? Kind of strange. Which title do you like better? Which title? Do you like Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Men or the Secrets of Men? I don't know. I don't know. I kind of like Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Men. Yeah, I kind of like that one. Let's see what uh, sequels of Men. Ooh, yeah, the sequel. Yeah, there is, you know, there is a uh, number two. There is a number two movie, but not not a sequel for the book because the author died and he couldn't do another sequel. It would have been nice if he would have done another one, right? It would have been nice. Her daughter made the second. Yeah, yeah, the daughter made it, right? Schmoop has a bone to pick with this ending. Schmoop is, a, uh, is an organization that analyzes uh, books and things like that. Sure, the Frisbees end up safe in their vacation home and the rats escape from the Nimmers once again, proving that brains beat brawn once again. You better have brains that have muscles because the brain will always win out. But the thing that really kills us is that we don't know if the rat, excuse me, if the rats ever make it to Thorn Valley. We don't know what happens. If they do make it, we don't know how they fare once they get there. We are dying to know the way we see it, there are a couple of possible reasons for this ending. Number one, the rats never make it to the valley. The Nimmers catch them and throw them back into captivity. But the author is scared of disappointing his readers and inspiring an angry mob. So he hides this from us. The author leaves the ending open for interpretation. And that's probably a more reasonable explanation. If you believe the rats make it, you can imagine what their lives are like on your own. If you think they didn't make it, you can cry quietly or loudly, if you like, into a pile of tissues. You know, there's been many directors and authors who leave the ending to your imagination. 
They leave. Like gone with the wind. Yeah, gone with the wind. Totally correct. You are totally correct. In Gone with the Wind, we don't know whether Scarlett O'Hara manages to get Red Butler back, right? Because he leaves. He leaves. And he says, okay, my dear, I don't give a darn what happens. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And she goes, all right, please. I love you. I love you. I love you. And then she says, okay, that's all right. Let him go. But I'm going to get him back. Tomorrow will be another day. And that's how she leaves it. So we say to ourselves, oh, my God, what happened here? Right? What happened? Did he take him? Did he take her back? Did she chase him? Did she not chase him? And there were actually books written by other people, by other authors, where they attempted to write an ending. Right? There were a couple of authors. But the books weren't really that important. Nobody really knows about them. I've never read them. I've read, of course, Gone with the Wind twice. And I've seen the movie maybe three times. But the other books, I never really read them. I, I don't think they're that important. I like it when it's left like that. Alfred Hitchcock, the director, used to do that all the time. He would kind of leave it up in the air. Also, Rod Serling of the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone. In the Twilight Zone, Rod Serling used to always leave the ending up to you to interpret. So sometimes that can be pretty entertaining. That can be pretty entertaining. We're going to go with option B, that the ending is left up to the reader's interpretation. And that's why it is purposefully vague. It's not, they don't tell us. The author leaves us with the, this image of a cuddly, snoozing frisbee outside the brook swam quietly through the woods. And up above them, the warm wind blew through a newly opened leaves of the big oak tree. Certainly, this is a happy ending for the Frisbees, but no mention of the rats. We don't know what happened to the rats. In a way, though, that makes perfect sense. After all, this book is all about the power of thinking for yourself and making your own decisions in that spirit. So what do you think about the ending? Are the rats living the life in the country or did something terrible befall them? Uh -huh. What do you think? I think eventually they all moved to New York City. Yep, I do. And they lived in apartments in New York City. Getting fat and having parties every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's my opinion. Setting. The Fitzgibbon Farm. This is where the setting is. This is where it all happened. When you think of a farm, you probably think about the silo, the barn, the horse stables, maybe an attractive cowboy or cowgirl hauling hay. You get the picture right. But what you might not immediately think about are all of the little nooks and crannies where various creatures can hide out. It's these little spaces where most of the action take place in this novel. And cinder block, a burrow under a rose bush, 
even an owl's nest. What is most important about setting in rats is that the spaces provide good cover and safety for the main characters who are pretty vulnerable because of their small size. They could get crunched very easily by a tractor, by a plow, by a truck, by a human. The novel mainly takes place on the Fitzgibbon farm in an unspecified but modern time. There are tractors and trucks and scientists who know what DNA is. But other than that, we don't have many clues about the time period. The main settings tell us a lot about the characters that live in them. Mrs. Frisbee's house, Mrs. Frisbee's house is a slightly damaged cement block that is furnished with bits of leaves, grass, cloth, cotton, fluff, and other soft things. This seems like a perfect spot for Mrs. Frisbee, who likes being snug and at home with her kids. The rat's den, the rat's burrow, on the other hand, is huge and has corridors that radiate it from it in as many different directions as petals from a daisy. They also have vaulted ceilings, glass windows, an elevator, and electricity. Their barrel tells us that they are technologically advanced, but also that they steal from humans, which is something that they are ashamed of. But you know, rats have been doing that all their lives. It's the perfect setup for these rats because it tells us right away that they are not your average rodents. They're living in high style, but at what cost? Nim and the Boniface estate. The flashback section of the novel takes place in the labs at Nim and in a huge vacant mansion called the Boniface estate. The cages in the lab are prisons. And duh, they make the rats feel crazed and claustrophobic. When they escape and come across the Boniface state, it's a huge contrast to their cages. In fact, it's just huge. The bars of Nim give way to books and library and wide open spaces at Boniface, both of which symbolize knowledge and freedom to the rats in the novel. Thousands of books about every subject you could think of. There were shelves of paperbacks. There were encyclopedias, histories, novels, philosophies, and textbooks. Luckily, there was even one of those small ladders on wheels they use in some libraries to get to the top shelf. The rat's destination lies deep in the forest. The mountains around it are forbidding, too steep and rocky even for the jeeps. The clearing that Nicodemus has in mind is a large natural clearing a glade where only coarse grass and wildflowers grow, grew. Sounds like paradise, doesn't it? Because the rats want to be as far away from people as possible. It is important that even jeeps can get there. Moving to Thorn Valley may be a dream. And we don't know if the rats ever make it. But the description sure makes it sound like 
a nice dream. Well, here is hoping for a happy ending. Tuffometer, sea level. You will need hiking boots or a pickaxe or loads of dried buffalo jerky to conquer this novel. It's easy to read. Nature lovers. In addition to being a fiction writer, Robert O'Brien was also a journalist. As you probably know, journalists are trained to tell the who, what, where, when, and why of a story with lot, with, without a lot of other stuff getting in the way. This is the way that rats is told as well. Straightforward, direct, to the point. Does this mean it's easy? Nope. You'll get a good workout as you read, which just means you'll be all the smarter for the effort you put in. Just like novels that are a little more difficult to slug through, this novel asks some of the big questions about love, family, power, and knowledge. So take a leisurely stroll through the novel, but don't forget to stop at some of the scenic lookouts on the way. There are some great view, views here, right? Very descriptive views. Writing style. So here's another something that we need to know about the novel that people that are into literature, they analyze, right? They analyze this stuff. What is the writing style? What is the writing style? Well, the experts say straightforward and simple. Not a lot of fancy words and not a lot of twists and turns. It's pretty much straightforward. For some reason, calling something simple is sometimes synonymous with calling it easy or not very smart. But we want to call your attention to some simple and awesome things for just a minute to debunk this trend. Apple pie with vanilla ice cream. Man, oh man, that is simple, but it's out of this world. Swimming on a summer, summer afternoon. Isn't that great? Hanging out with your dog, taking a cat nap. So these are things that are simple, but are pretty darn good. They're awesome. All simple, also all awesome. So you can have simple things that are really pretty good. So when we say that the tone of the rats is simple, we, need, we mean simply that it isn't that flashy. It isn't flashy. You don't get huge vocabulary words that'll send you to your favorite online dictionary on every page. And neither do you get flowery passages with tons of adjectives and millions of commas. Instead, you get straightforward language that tells a good story. Sure, feelings can run high and some points in the book, like when Miss Frisbee makes her speech about how the rats deserve a chance because it would be the first time in all the world that intelligent beings besides men have ever tried to start a real civilization of their own. And this is in the book. But even if at key high point moments like this, the style of the novel never becomes anything but direct and to the point. Books, books and rats, rats and books, books and rats, rats and books. They go together like Oreo and milk. Ooh, have you ever had a glass of milk with a, an Oreo cookie? Isn't that the greatest thing in the world? At least in this story, 
Books are very important in rats because books provide the rats with the knowledge they need to change their lives. But isn't that the truth with all of us? When we read and we learn, our lives changes, right? They say that people with an education live longer. Why? Because they know how to take care of their bodies. They say people with an education are happier because they understand the world better. So knowledge, knowledge is always good. When the rats arrive at Boniface, they gravitate to the library because it is typically filled with books. Nicodemus explains that they fell on those books with even more appetite than on the food. Since we all know that rats love to eat, this must mean that they really loved these books. And every time they get to reading, we can't help but notice that it gives them a big fat dose of knowledge and power. Uh -huh. How about that? Take, for example, when Mrs. F, when Mrs. Frisbee goes into the rat's library and sees how many stacks of books there are. She's amazed by the electricity. Sure, but the books really hammer home how smart and exceptional the rats really are. Knowledge is power, but also pain. Even though books contain powerful information that the rats need, they also have the power to cause pain. Most of the books were about people. We tried to find some about rats, but there wasn't much. We did find a few things. There were two sets of encyclopedias that had sections on rats. From them, we learned that they were about the most hated animals on earth, except maybe snakes and germs. Learning about how hated they are is a major bummer for the rats who feel like this is unfair because they're super rats after all. But hey, there's an upside to all of this. Even though this hurts their feelings, it's information that they absolutely need in order to survive. The books are more than just a way to show that these rats have some serious brain power. The knowledge inside them helps the rats to develop a plan to be free of the humans who hate them. In that sense, reading and books are the keys to survival or our fairy friends. Cages. In literature as in life, cages are usually wildly unpopular. Nobody wants cages. They're small, they're cramped, they're locked. Honestly, what's to like? It follows then that the characters in rats hate cages as much as the rest of us do. Each time a character is in a cage, he or she has her freedom restricted. He or she absolutely hates it. Captivity, always a bad thing for rats, but always a bad thing for everybody, for everything. Nobody wants to be captive. Never is this clearer than when the rats are locked up behind bars in Nim. However, because our rats are brainy, they understand that cages don't just prevent them from moving around like they would like to. They also prevent them from thinking and knowing as much as they would like to. Aha, uh -huh. yes, Alan, humans go to jail and they don't like it. You know, when humans go to jail, they don't like it. They don't like it, nobody likes it. But of course, the humans that go to jail most of the time is because most of the time, there are times that they are unjustly accused 
But most of the time, it's because they committed a crime. Yeah, humans go to jail, you're totally correct. Just the fact that it was a cage made it horrible. I, who had always run where I wanted, could go three hops forward, and that was all. But worse was the dreadful feeling that we were at the mercy of someone who knew not at all for some purpose we could not guess. Right? And that's in the book. Horrible is a good word for what has happened to the rats. But in this quote, the cage is also linked to not knowing about what is going to happen, which is even more horrible. Think about it. When you're in a cage, you can only see so much of what's going on in the outside world. Whatever's going on beyond the three feet of space right in front of us, in front of the cage door is entirely out of reach. That's got to feel frightening, doesn't it? Got to feel frightening. Mrs. Frisbee in the cage of doom. Mrs. Frisbee, our heroine, also has a run in with a nasty cage. Being placed in a bird cage is particularly terrible for Mrs. Frisbee because she has a whole bunch of information that she needs to share with the rats about their impending death and the hand of those mysterious government exterminators. Her entrapment is heightened by the sense of suspense. She is also prevented quite literally from taking care of her kids by the vertical bars, smooth and no thicker than matchsticks. And that's in the book, right? By chapter 25, it's clear that cages in rats equal very, very bad news. Not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. Technology. Okay, raise your hand if you like having a cell phone. Ah, me, 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 I like it. Or a computer. Me, 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 I like it too. Or being able to ride in cars or take plane to visit somewhere warm and awesome. Just as we thought, all hands are raised. Yeah, me too, me too, me too. Now raise your hand if even though you like technology, you can think of some flaws. So technology, technology is good, but sometimes technology can be a problem. Has your computer ever broken and then you go crazy and you pound your head against the, the table or your phone is not working right or you can't get a good connection or you get the wrong information when you go into a website? Say, for example, cars polluting the environment. That, that's another one, right? Or that terrible bully on Facebook posting snarky, excuse me, snarky comments about your perfectly lovely best friend again all all hands raised just as we expected congratulations you and our brainiacs rats feel similarly about issues of science and technology it's cool but sometimes there are downsides right not always great. Nothing is always great. So it's no surprise then that technology is a symbol of both good and evil in the book. Not always good. 
not always good. Okay, so why don't we leave it here? I'm gonna put a little message that says, this is the last one that we did and I can't remember what number it was. Do you guys remember? I think it's, uh, let's see. Here we're gonna put, uh, I think this was seven. Let's go back. Yep, seven. Yep, okay. So we'll put number seven. And if you guys wanna stay a little longer, I am gonna play a little bit of the video. And we're going to save it. And for those of you who have a little bit of time, uh, I saved it and we're going to get back to the video and just watch it for like five minutes. I can't, uh, can't stay long because I gotta what time is it in your area? I gotta one of my classes. What's that? What time is it in your area? Uh, right now it's 9.30, 9.30 p.m. 9 oh, me too. Yeah, 9.30 at night. Some and people, um, they're in the, in the different area. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm in the Eastern area. Yeah, you're Eastern, right? Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's still my third. Yeah, yeah. So we all kind of have the same problem because not only do I have to go to bed pretty soon, but actually I'm putting a uh, another class for tomorrow. Um, I got to make sure that I deliver a good class, right? We all kind of have to do our homework.